Okay, um, so I think we're going to start. Um, and, and again, um, I want to uh, welcome you to the sixth presentation in our How to Live Forever series. Uh, my name is Corey Schneider, and I'm so very excited to be with you. Uh, as Archives Chair for Women's League, my goal is not only to tell Women's League's story, but to help you tell yours. Um, before we begin, we'll, I want to let you know we'll be recording the session. So if you don't want to be seen, please turn off your video. Everyone will be muted to avoid unwanted background noise. We are also disabling the chat during the presentation, but we'll turn it on uh, at the end so you can put your questions in the chat box. And of course, you can contact me anytime and I've sent you, I will send you my contact information. Uh, we have a special welcome from Debbie Goldich, Women's League International President, and Ellen Bresnick and Julia Loeb, Co-Chairs of Education, as well as Rabbi Ellen Wollens fields um, Debbie and Ellen and Julia are not able to be with us tonight, but they do send their greetings. Uh, many, many thanks to Sheila Kaufman. Oops. Unmute. You're muted, Corey. Did you not hear any of it? Just Sheila Kaufman after that. We didn't okay. Um, so Sheila is our techie guru and she has been wonderful. Um, she's going to be doing the PowerPoint and uh, unmuting and muting and whatever else needs to be done. And, and she has been for many of these sessions and I'm really grateful to Sheila, as well as to Carol Simon, who is our Q&A coordinator. And, and Carol will be uh, working on the Q&A at the end of the session. So um, our agenda tonight, and Sheila will begin the PowerPoint, please. All right, we have to, Sheila, there we go, okay. Just wait a minute until we get that set. It will be done in a minute, Sheila. Don't don't leave anybody. We're going to get there. Corey, I sent her a message that we okay, can't good. do anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. And, and Sheila, if you just do the, change that to slide only or whatever it is. You see it now? We can see it, but it, it's got the slides on the left. If you could do it, just slideshow. So that and I not... have it on the show on my end. That's interesting. Okay, hold on. Okay. Try it again. Thank you. Okay, it's not going, is it? No. Okay, hold on, I'll try. Try it one more time. Thank you, Sheila. How's that? That's you... perfect. Thank you. You're okay, so our agenda tonight includes some beginning thoughts, all about books, or not all, but some about books, uh, family trees, games, crafts, and projects, 
and a lot for kids, gatherings and holidays, going digital and Q&A. And again, the topic for tonight, and some of these things uh, we may have covered in previous sessions, but really it's to highlight creative and innovative ways to share your family story. Um, as, as I said in the, in the publicity for this session, um, I've heard so many times from people, how do I get my kids interested? Nobody's seen my kids, my grandkids, nobody seems to be interested in, in our history or our story. And tonight really is dedicated to different ways that you can tell your story that will be, will stimulate uh, interest from future generations and the ones that you're dealing with today. So, um, what you do, and we can go to the next slide, please. We're waiting. Just give us a chance to get this uh, done. Great. What you do is your history. What you set in motion is your legacy. So again, tonight's session is all about turning your family history into a legacy. To do that, we want to connect present and future generations to their ancestors so they understand and appreciate who they are by knowing about who they come from. We want to make their history into part of your legacy by creating ways to pass it on that will engage, interest, and excite your family. Yes, it's a tall, order. There are many different ways of presenting and sharing your research, and it really comes down to whatever works for you. It might be with just your immediate family, or it might be with the whole world. It's entirely up to you to do to you as to who you share it with and how you share it. As we delve into creative ways this can be done, I urge you not to look at the end goal. For in fact, this is a never ending process. I have never been able to picture myself sitting back at some point and saying, huh, I'm done. I have shared my family history. Mm, I know that will never happen. Never be fully done. So I try not to, I try not to drown myself in the possibilities. I just do it. I try to, try to focus on just a piece of what I wanna do so I don't become overwhelmed and paralyzed by what I want to accomplish in the end. So please just take one step at a time. Focus on what a wonderful time you are having working on it and the joy in revealing that history to yourself and others as you continue the process. What I am telling, trying to tell you is to enjoy the journey and get as close to the end as time and effort and interest will allow. I am very excited to now present you to many creative ways to share your family history. Please know that there are literally hundreds and maybe even thousands more ways to be being creative, being created all the time. I have collected these ideas from research on the internet, ideas passed on by some of you and ways that I have used. Once again, I must caution you. I don't think there is any way one person can use all the ideas or even most of them. If you use just one or two, that's fabulous. The session is really meant to motivate and stimulate you to do just something more, more than you have already done. Following the presentation, we will, we will open the session to questions and sharing of ideas. I have recently started, next slide please. I have recently decided, I have recently started creating more photo books. Actually, I learned from the How to Live Forever Dealing with All Those Pictures and Documents session we had in July 
that we have to make it easy to pass our archives from generation to generation. As I looked at my 10 pound wedding album, and you see that on the bottom of that pile of very thick albums, and other albums prepared each time my parents had a big celebration, plus all the other photo albums and scrapbooks I have, and you see that on the right, and there's actually another shelf that I didn't even show you. Um, I, I knew I had to do something. No one was going to schlep 100 plus pounds of albums through the generations. So this is what one of the things I've started to do. I decided to tackle the wedding album first, the biggest and the heaviest. Believe it or not, that big fat album only had 24 pictures. My first thought was to scan each of the pictures and make a photo book, weighing about eight ounces and a half inch thick. Big difference. As I thought about it, I decided to cover the beginning of Stan and I, my husband is Stan, from meeting to marriage and include the stories that go along with those years. Because I find it very easy to place pictures and text in a PowerPoint, my personal preference is to create the PowerPoint. Using the PowerPoint program, I save the whole presentation as a JPEG picture so that each slide becomes a page in the book. Whatever works for you is what you should do. It was really fun telling our story. I titled the book, as you see there, In the Beginning. It brought back wonderful memories, and I was able to reduce about 20 pounds of albums and scrapbooks to the one photo book. I also included pictures and scans of our ketubah, marriage license, and articles in the paper announcing our engagement and wedding. It was such fun. By the way, our you can't see it, I don't think, but our marriage license was $3. Times change. Next slide, please. Then I took some of the other heavy albums I had of my parents' celebrations throughout their 60 plus years of, together. I ended up chronicling and sharing stories about them and their lives with lots of the pictures into another photo book, less than a half pound. Doing it was like a wonderful extended visit with my mom and dad. Um, the stories were fabulous. What is also super about the photo books is that I can make copies for any and all. In addition, I can save the PowerPoint or the photo book as a PDF and easily email it, which I have done with the book about my parents to my brothers, nieces, and nephews. And they really loved it a way to get them excited about their family and for carrying on the stories for the family. Here's a caution or a, a, a thing you, a, a request. Please remember, if you don't know PowerPoint or are not great with the computer or scanning pictures or any of the technology, there are lots and lots and lots of vendors who will do it for you. And that is true for any of the ideas presented. If you are uncomfortable tackling it yourself, there will be a vendor who will be more than willing to do it for you. Please don't say, well, I don't know PowerPoint. I don't know how to scan my pictures. You can have it done for you. The important thing is to create a great, way, an enthusiastic way, an interesting way of sharing your story to, in, to motivate others and their interests. I will say this again during the session. It is important you don't get overwhelmed and not do things because you are not crafty or feel you are not creative. Others can do it for you. And don't forget, next slide, and, okay, we'll wait. It's not coming up, Sheila.
Mm. Yeah, somehow I'm frozen. Okay. Bear with me one second. Sure. Okay, something's not happening. There we go. Okay, great. Um, and don't forget an heirlooms photo book. Um, and I talked about that before and you see, um, I don't know if you can't see my thing, but there's the heirlooms. There's a little cover for an heirlooms photo book. <coughs> Excuse me. Toby Blake took photos of the heirlooms she wanted her children to know about. She then wrote a brief narrative about the history of the object and why it was important to her family. It is an ongoing, ongoing project, which she hopes will allow them to value those pieces as much as she does. And even when the items have been distributed, there is still the books. And if you look at the bottom left picture, I don't know if you can see it, but the title of that page is Four Generations, One Dress. And it shows what happened to the dress in the upper right, which was used uh, uh, by her grandmother, I believe, to attend a wedding, and then with successive generations. Very exciting. Toby, if you look at the top right, also made a recipe book. Each page had, page had a recipe. How she learned about it and how it was handed down in the family, plus a picture of the person from whom she got the recipe. When possible, she put in a picture of the finished dish. All her grandchildren like to cook. So it will certainly be something they will treasure and use. And the bottom right page is, is a scrapbook page. Um, she also made a scrapbook book. The page pictured here tells the scary story of the family needle arts tradition. So just begin to think in your own mind um, what you could do for the things in your family. So a few months after I had my first grandchild, and this was, uh, I can't believe it, but 28 years ago, I was talking to a friend who had Bubby and Zadie camp at her home for a few weeks each summer. She told me she had each child write a journal with pictures of their time there, a great heirloom and a great way to interest the family. I love the idea and modified it for my two young grandchild, only a couple of weeks old, and all those who followed them. Adventure books for each. They are both basically photo scrapbooks of each grandchild's adventures with Stan and I. Each photo has a caption written from the child's perspective, such as, in Z Bubby and Zadie come to see, you know, come to visit me as I'm born or something like that. Every time we do something special, I make that grandchild adventure book pages. I keep the book and it's in a loose leaf so we can add pages. I keep the book until the grandchild is able to read it fluently and take care of it at about age eight. It has been a big occasion when each grandchild gets to keep theirs and then proudly adds pages I give them after each adventure. I never realized how valued they were until unfortunately there was a fire in our then 25 year old grandson's apartment building. The structure was compromised and he was only allowed in twice for five minutes each time to get his most precious possessions. Amazingly, he chose to rescue his somewhat soggy adventure book. He asked me to redo it. I was and am still filled with such emotion and gratitude that he loves it and the memories of times we spend together. And the book pictured here is our youngest grandchild, Evan's adventure book, which he has not gotten yet. He just turned seven and we will give it to him probably for his eighth birthday. But when he comes to visit, we read the adventure, book, the adventure book together. In just about a week, Stan and I hopefully will be taking our whole family, including our 10 grandchildren, for a week to a resort in the Dominican Republic. 
Although it would take, will take lots of picture taking and lots of hours, I look forward to creating adventure book pages for each of them when we return. Another wonderful book you can create is your story, your adventures, your memories. In sessions two and three of the series, Ellen Bresnick, Women's League Education Co-Chair, presented two fabulous sessions on how to write your stories. If you miss them or want a refresher, they are available for viewing through links on the Women's League website. Just search for How to Live Forever. Last spring, our sons gifted each of us with a wonderful tool called StoryWorth.com. StoryWorth is a great way to enjoy memories and reflections and share them with future generations. By signing up for a one year of storytelling, you or a loved one, if you give a gift subscription, will receive a weekly question meant to stir up long buried memories or unearth perspectives previously unknown. At the end of the year, the stories are collected into one hardcover book, complete with photos and captions that can be included with the stories. And as a bonus, Women's League has become a partner with StoryWorth. So when you use their referral link, you get a $10 discount and Women's League makes a commission as well. I will send you the link following this session and it's also been appearing on the Women's League Week. It has really been a wonderful experience and I'm so excited to share our stories this way. I only wish that my parents had story worth and gave us books of their stories. Of course, it's too late for that, but we can do for our children what our parents were not able to do for us. Let's talk about family trees. A family tree is a type of chart or diagram representing generations of families and how they are linked throughout the years. Showing where you came from can open your and future generations eyes to how beautiful and unique you are. It can also give an increased sense of self-worth and belonging. Getting the information to build a family tree is a study in itself. There are many computer programs that will give you great assistance in gathering the information into a viewable format. Plus check out the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies for a list of, our, of local member societies. And I'll give you that website in the resource sheet I'll send you after this session. Family trees can take many forms. Let's just look at a few to spark your imagination as to ways you can show yours. One ways, as you can see in the top right, is a simple form generated from, from a computer program. Um, it happens to be one that I use called GenoPro, but there are many. There are also lots of pre-printed trees that can be filled in and you see those um, on the bottom there. Or you can try and cross stitch a tree and you see that on the left. You can also design and create your own. And remember, if you are uncomfortable tackling it yourself, there will be a vendor who will be more than willing to do it for you. It's important you don't get overwhelmed and not do things because you are not crafty or feel you are not creative. Others can do it for you. There's also some very interesting tree art. Some pictures here were done by both individuals and professionals. I show them to you to stimulate your imagination. Other creative ways are shown in the next slide. On the left of this slide is a vintage family chalkboard family tree. Just photocopy or print photos of relatives, place them on a chalkboard, and you can glue them or uh, attach them in some way, and uh, write the names in chalk, simple. Um, on the right are examples of magnetic family trees, interesting. Print pictures of family members and label the backs with who they are. Place a small magnet on the back of each picture and create your family tree using a magnetic surface. Your refrigerator, if it's still magnetic, uh, a metal tray. It's a great children's activity. You remember those magnetic letters that the kids used to play with and put on the refrigerator, right? 
Well, now they can do it in a family tree. You can even buy family tree magnets. The possibilities are endless. Or create a photo wall family tree. How interesting are those, right? It's a great way to put photos of your ancestors on display. It's a way of remembering who they are as well as creating family interest. A great spot for a photo family tree is that if you have stairs, a second floor is as you go up the steps. Um, and you see, um, you can create a, your family tree with a wall decal. And you see that on the right. And that can be purchased, interestingly enough, at Home Depot. And you can change the pictures as you go to create more interest. On the bottom is a full-size genealogy wall chart, full size. There are two of them there. You see one on the floor and one on the left. It's printed to make more room for big families. These are great conversation starters at family reunions. This one was printed by a company called Ancestry Graphics and Printing. They will print your family tree directly from your data and the software you used. Um, and again, um, if you're uncomfortable with the computer stuff, involve your kids, your grandkids in doing it with you. It will interest them as well in, in their own family's history. With more information on your tree or the program you're using to organize the information, you can build a family timeline. Timelines are great tools for family historians. At the most very basic level, they are a great way to organize your family history information. However, if done in detail and with much thought, they can help reveal gaps in your research and link world events to family history events. It's so interesting when you can look at a year of what happened in your family and then what was happening in the world. And in fact, um, I've been, we've done a timeline for Women's League that does just that. And that will be shortly, hopefully, put on the Women's League website in our archives section. So you can enjoy that one. Next, I'd like to show you a potpourri of games, crafts, and projects for both children and adults. Many of these ideas can be adapted to use at family reunions and gatherings. For card games, make two sets of cards with each ancestor's picture. And examples of fun games are ancestor matching. And you'll recognize these from, from games that you have purchased and played with your kids and grandkids. The, this version helps children to recognize their ancestors by name and face. Lay one set spread out with cards up, have children pick from the second pile and find the card that matches. Even the littlest kids can do that. An ancestor memory game is when you mix all cards, two of each ancestor, put all of the cards face down in rows, and then players take turns picking two cards and reading the names of the ancestors. If it's a match, the person who finds the match will keep the cards. The player with the most matches at the end of the game wins. There's lots of interesting ways to do this. Ah, and that game that we all know and play, Go Fish. Mix all of the cards, two of each ancestor, deal five to seven cards to each player and set the remaining cards in a deck in the middle of the players. Hold cards in hand so they are not visible to other players. You know the rules, right? Each player will take turns asking one of the other players for a specific ancestor card. If the person the player asked has, has it, he or she, she will take it. If not, the player will draw a card from the pile in the middle. When there are no more cards in the middle, all players count how many matches they have. The person with the most matches wins. And if you want to do it a little bit with more cards, you can have like a half a dozen, four cards in a family. So it's members of an immediate family. Lots of ways to, to vary it and play it uh, with you, your adults and grandkids and your family. We also can play bingo, which is easy. Make bingo cards with the name of an ancestor in each square, hold up a picture and have the children or the adults put a token on the name of the ancestor who is in the picture. And you can figure out, you can, I think your imagination can, can go forward with different variations of that family bingo. Family history trivia. 
<clears throat> As you are learning about your ancestors, write down facts about them. These facts can be turned into a trivia game. Questions such as who first immigrated to the United States from Poland, Denmark, wherever. What mode of transportation did blank use for getting to synagogue in Poland? Jeopardy and Trivial Pursuit are great trivia games. Making your own version of these games with information about your ancestors will challenge you and help you remember what you are learning. The level of difficulty of the question should depend on the age of those involved. Legos. Use Legos to tell the story of an ancestor. You can play out the story with the Lego pieces and even choose to record it. Another great way to interest your, to interest family in your story is through scavenger hunts. Use your family heirlooms to discover the importance of family history and preserve the story. The hunt can take place anywhere. For instance, ask family members, especially kids, to find five objects around their home that are related to their families or personal history or you. When they have identified and gathered five items, you could have them complete an heirloom research log which includes the story behind the heirloom. The hunt can also be done by sleuthing through a blog, blog Facebook post, or other online storage, such as Dropbox. And we'll talk more about digi digital work later. And, and let me again tell you that these ideas for the scavenger hunts and other things were found on the internet. And uh, I give you resources for them please note that it's not something um, that you have to do on your own. There's lots of help. Here are some ideas for a more long-term hunt that may end at a family gathering or reunion or a holiday. You can even identify points for each object to make it competitive and give gifts to the winners. Things to hunt and do might be to find a grave in a cemetery or make a rubbing of the gravestone or read a story about that person. Put together a puzzle with a family photo or ancestor face on it. You can either order customized puzzles online or make your own. There's a great site called collage.com that does puzzles, uh, that does puzzles anywhere from 12 pieces to a thousand pieces. Do something that your ancestors would have done like lasso a sore cross, change a cloth diaper, haul buckets of water or wash clothes and hang them on a clothesline. Tell someone you don't know a story about one of your ancestors. Find a house that an ancestor lived in. Dress up in old fashioned clothes and take a photo. And I don't know if anybody, I, I know that when we go to the beach sometimes there are these um, stores that you can have costumes, you can dress up in old photos and take a picture. And it's really a lot of fun. So think about how it would be if the kids, the family dressed up in pictures of, of ancestors who came from Europe or China or wherever, and then took a picture and pretended they were the ancestors. A lot of interest, a lot of, lot of a good way to stimulate the interest. Find a house, uh, I'm sorry, sing a song or read a poem that was important to an ancestor. If you're doing a scavenger hunt at an extended family reunion, you may choose to add these items. Find someone who knew a certain ancestor. Find someone who has lived in that town for at least 30 years or meet five people you don't know. There are also an incredible number of games available for, for purchase to stimulate interest for both adults and children in your family history. Trivia, Monopoly, bingo, memory games. You don't have to be creative to excite your family about learning your story. You just need to be motivated to do so. And, and these, these are all available for purchase. Um, they do the work for you. In addition, there are lots of ideas for crafts. Next slide, please. Uh, you can cross stitch a family picture or needle per point a crossword pillow or even create a coloring book, which I thought was so interesting, I had not seen that. There are easy and free online tools to inspire you to create a coloring book to celebrate your heritage. You can use family pictures as you see on the left or kids drawings done by parents or grandparents as you see on the right. 
you, next slide, please. Thank you, Sheila. You, or an awesome cake-making person, can create a family tree cake and incorporate the names of your family on it. It's bound to create interest amongst everyone there. Oh, I wanna eat Grandma Ida. <laughs> Ancestor bookmarks are a fun way to share your family history when you have a lot of photos. These make a great souvenir for family reunions as it's an easy way to share a photo or simple ancestor's story. The best way is that every bookmark is, the best part is that every bookmark is unique because so are your ancestors. And you can see that all of these, except for the cakes, which may also have been, can be done by vendors. You don't have to worry. You just have to supply the information. Or, next slide, please. Use a stamp collection to create an heirloom to interest future generations in their history. Barbara Weiss did that. Her father was an avid stamp collector and most of his stamps were neatly organized into albums. The rest you see in the basket on the left. Even though he had the best intentions to organize them, it never happened. So Barbara decided to make something useful, decorative and practical out of them. After browsing Pinterest, a great site for ideas, by the way, she came upon, upon this idea glass vases decorated with stamps using glue and Mod Podge. Each grandchild was gifted a vase as a memento of their grandfather. What a creative way to stimulate interest in their family history. And don't forget family gatherings. Organize a family reunion. You can do it in person or on Zoom. It's a wonderful opportunity to share family stories, share family photos, perform family skits, capture oral histories, highlight heirlooms. And the picture on the right is a Zoom that I did with my, my mom's families, my cousins from my mom's family. It was just wonderful. And it was only 40 minutes because that's all I have the free Zoom. And after 40 minutes, it goes, you know, you it, it, dies, it ends. But it was just really nice. We had not connected at, for a very long time. There are lots of articles and suggestions on how and what to do that can be found on the internet. internet. It's so terrific to connect with family in person or in Zoom. Or, I love this idea, have a birthday bash. The party can play, take place on or near the birthday of an ancestor. Identify all their favorite things, share fun stories and pictures of the person. If you celebrate an ancestor originally from another country, you can in, even include authentic food, games and decorations to make the event really memorable. I have not personally done a birthday bash, but I have done Zoom gatherings on or near the Ancestors Yurt site to share memories, stories, and information. They have been so very meaningful. You can also take field trips. Gather together to visit, if possible, possible one of your family's cemeteries. Take pictures of the headstones and place the ancestors on your family tree. Tell stories about them or give a bio of their lives. Pictured on the bottom of the slide in the center is the cemetery where my mom's family's graves are. Visit places that are important to your family. Take pictures of those places and record stories about what happened there. Consider asking a relative to take you on a tour of his or her hometown or do a tour of your own home and hometown, including your school, synagogue, favorite park and playground. You know what, your grandchildren may really love to see the elementary school you went to or your favorite store um, or the movie theater if it's still there uh, that you frequented. In the top middle picture is my grandfather in 1951 standing in front of his dry goods store. And to the right of it, the street <clears throat> is where my grandparents lived and my dad grew up. The picture was taken two years ago, the one on the right, 
when we went on a family pilgrimage to Brooklyn to share stories and show where my grandparents lived and worked. The arrow points to the rooftop my dad accessed by climbing through the kitchen window to get some alone time from the crowded apartment. Our grandchildren really related to that story. They could picture their grandfather climbing through that window. And, and here are some sto story, some ideas for holiday gatherings. And it is just a beginning. The gathering of family around the holidays may be a perfect time to enthuse your family and share your personal history. Along with many of the suggestions presented tonight that could be adapted, here are just a few more. At Rosh Hashanah, have a discussion about some of your ancestors and what sins they might have thrown away with their bread during Tashlech. Are your sins the same? At Yom Kippur, Share a memory or story about an ancestor and how you would like to be remembered. There is a custom each evening of Sukkot to invite special guests, Ushbizim and Ushbizot, into the sukkah. Every evening, the patriarchs, matriarchs, and their families are welcomed. <clears throat> Try putting up pictures of your ancestors and inviting them along with stories about who they were and how they lived. At Thanksgiving, pass around information about ancestors with pictures, like the bookmarks, the trading cards that we showed, and have someone talk about the ancestor, <coughs> excuse me, and perhaps tell why they are thankful that they are part of who they are. During Hanukkah, dedicate a candle each night to an ancestor and tell about them. At any holiday, play, Pin the name on the family tree. For Passover, have adults and children choose an ancestor to bring to the Seder and talk about their lives. What things they may have both been slave to and how they might have worked toward freedom. Is it the same for you? Or are you slave to different things? And in what way? At Shafua, we read from Deuteronomy, I am making the covenant both with those here today before the Lord our God and also with those not here today. Ask which ancestor would you like to stand next to as we received the Torah and why? And a universal question for any holiday. How do you think your ancestor, name a name, celebrated this holiday? Certainly, this is just a beginning list. Before each holiday, brainstorm with a few of your guests, with some of your family for other ideas. And these, these ideas that I just gave you were ones that I just sat down with and talked about with, with a friend or two and said, what do you think? And we came up with all these ideas in about 10 minutes. So you can do it and make it, make it really meaningful for you and your family at your holiday gatherings. It is also exciting to go digital, but first a caution. The ideas here are meant to interest and excite your family about their history. They are not meant for permanent storage. Technology, and I've said it before, changes so quickly. Did you know that new computers no longer come with a disk drive? Hmm. Keep hard copies of everything so it can be passed from generation to generation. Blogging is one of the easiest ways to be able to share your research with the world. It's free, you can do it when you want to, and you can do it from home. It can be as little as a paragraph or more as you see fit. Make it interesting, add photos of people or places, You've done the research, so why not tell your family and the wider world the stories of your ancestors? Toby Blake invited her family to subscribe to her blog so they get a notice when new content is added or they can have it delivered to their email box. Her family blog allows her children and grandchildren to read about the family that she researched. Her family likes it because it is a quick read and it is easy to access on smartphones or tablets when they are on the go. Share family history 
with kids through shareable art for social media. If the kids already are surfing your feed, why not share with them some family history in a creative, colorful post? You can use available apps such as Rona Collage or Rona Designs to create shareable art for posting to social media. Post pictures of ancestors and add a background and text. Use electronic storage like Google Drive, Dropbox.com, and Box.com. Electronic storage is a wonderful way to share information with extended family and keep things up to date. Family members can access all the information, and if it is set up that way, can even add their own. To entice kids to dive into the materials, set up a scavenger hunt or a quiz with prizes. Shown on the slide on the left is the table of contents of my family history Dropbox. There are lots of subfolders in each of the main folders. And please remember, it doesn't have to be done all at once and can be built and enhanced over the years. There are lots of creative ideas that have been shared for you with you to choose from, to interest and excite your family. And once again, if you are uncomfortable tackling it yourself, there will be a vendor who will be more than willing to do it for you. There will be a child or grandchild who can travel with you on this most exciting path. It is important you do not get overwhelmed and afraid to do things because you are not really crafty or feel you are not creative. Others can do it for you. You will be also surprised as to how creative you can be. This whole series has been about living forever and you will live as long as you are remembered. So what's next? Next slide, please. Thank you. For those who are registered and or attended this session, who registered for and or attended this session, we will send you the creative and innovative ways, tips and resources handout with useful information and links to some helpful articles. This is the last in the How to Live Forever series. However, the recording of all six sessions and the resource sheets may be found in the Women's League Net website in the next few weeks. I hope tonight's program has motivated and enthused you to start collecting, caring for, writing down the stories, and even creating new family heirlooms. It is an incredible journey to live forever through your story, one that benefits you as the storyteller and the collector. It is also a priceless gift to your family and future generations. The gift of better knowing who they are and because they understand where they come from. So go and do and enjoy. The chat box is now going to be open and Carol Simon will look for your questions and suggestions. Okay, Corey, so far no questions, but um... We are 56 people, so up to you if you want to try and open it up. And if you do, then I will just keep scrolling through to see if people have their hands up. That sounds great. Okay, you want to do that? Yeah, um, chat. It's open. So, chat is open. Okay. okay. Um, so um, I, I want to say a little bit about StoryWorth. Um, it's a... It's a wonderful tool and I, I talk about it personally because Stan and I were given the gift of a subscription, each given a gift of the subscription to StoryWorth when we, uh, this summer, uh, I think I got it for Mother's Day, Stan got it for Father's Day or something like that. And uh, it's been a really interesting process. Uh, you receive a, an email each week with a question uh, and you can change the question if you want. Uh, things like, uh, what was your most memorable vacation? What was your mother like when you were a child? Uh, what were things, what was the, I, I don't know. There's all kinds of questions there. If you go on their site, there's like 250 questions. And many times now that Stan and I are, we've each written um, over 20 stories. 
Uh, and uh, now that we've written so many, we really are now creating our own questions. Uh, one that Stan answered last week was, what was the riskiest thing you ever did? Uh, interesting. What happens is it's been a real process because we end up remembering things and sharing recollections uh, that we would never have shared with our kids. Um, or we have shared with our kids and they, maybe they don't remember or we don't remember. Um, and then after the year or more, if you choose to include, you know, extend the, the subscription, you end up uh, with a hardcover book. And you can, you can create the order that you want of your stories. You add pictures, you add all kinds of stuff. And it's been really fascinating. Um, I was so taken with it that I, we contacted StoryWorth um, because as an individual, if, if you, uh, somebody else buys a subscription with your referral uh, link, then you get an extra book. And so I contacted them and I said, listen, I don't want an extra book. Um, I want Women's League. Uh, how about if we work it through Women's League? So every time that one of you might order the subscription through Women's League, uh, Women's League will get a commission and you will get $10 off. So it, it works. And we've had quite a few people who've already done that on order subscriptions. So let's see. Um, uh, I see chat. nothing in the chat. I don't see too many hands up. I just want to tell you, uh, while I was waiting for it to start, I registered for StoryWorth, changed the first questions, really easy to do, really yes. easy to sign up. So that's a great thing. And you can pre-order as many copies as you want at a discount. So. And I have to tell you that um, I wish my parents had story worth. I really do. I would have liked to get a sense as to who they were. And a lot of what I do is, is um, a lot of what I've been doing with the archives is so that I, our stories will not be lost uh, okay, as so my parents were. Corey Michelle Kunzman from West Hartford, go right ahead. Hi, okay, Michelle. Th thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention that Last year, I gave my parents, my parents were both still with us last year. I gave them uh, each a subscription of StoryWorth. I, I don't remember where I read about it, but I thought it was a great idea because I, I kept wanting to get my kids to sit down with my parents and hear some of these wonderful stories they had because I would try to tell my kids the stories and I realized I'm leaving half the details out and, and it's not written down. And they were really into it. They started, you know, I think January 1st, you know, getting their questions. And sometimes they didn't like them. Um, and I kept saying, you can change it, you can change it. You know, so and sometimes dad would just write one sentence or two, but he wrote this whole long, like two page thing about his own dad, like what was his dad like? And, you know, and they, they were really into it. And I'm so glad I did it um, because well, my dad kind of, stopped doing it about the middle of the year and then he passed away in August. And so I'm thrilled that we have this. And now I'm trying to figure out what do I do? You know, cause I've got like half the book left that's not filled, you know, he, he answered, you know, 26 questions or whatever. And so I'm trying to gather pictures and, and other things. And I thought that what I would do is um, send out an email to all of his grandkids, my siblings and all of their kids and, and maybe their kids, the great grandkids and just, um, ask them all to submit like their favorite memory of, you know, their grandpa, great grandpa, dad, et cetera. Um, and meanwhile, mom's still keeping up. She feels guilty when she gets behind and then she, you know, sits right down and does it. And I kept telling them, you don't have to do it if it's a burden, but they really enjoyed it. And like you said, I think they started talking about things or they would like, when dad was still alive, like, you know, help each other fill in some of the details and, and it's all gonna be lost if it's not written down because I certainly don't remember all of these things. So I, I haven't gotten my books yet. I haven't figured out how I'm gonna finish off dad's book, but I'm, I'm just so glad I did it and wish I'd done it a year earlier, but I didn't know about it then. Uh, Michelle, let me just tell you, I've been in, in touch with StoryWorth and if you, if you have a question that's not answered, that you need an answer to, they're, they're really good. It takes about 24 to 48 hours. Okay, um, great. Also, uh, since Stan, the books, you can have a book up to, I think, 300 or 350 or maybe even 400 pages each book. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to combine, and you may want to do this with your parents, we're going to combine Stan and my book into one book. So that means we get two books right off the bat. 
Um, so you can check with them and you can add photos after and uh, do all kinds of stuff. Um, Esther? Yeah, Esther Kaufman has her hand up. Hi. Um, I just want to talk about two things that my daughter-in-law has done. Um, one thing was at um, the rehearsal dinner the night before they got married, she presented us with a needlepoint, handmade needlepoint of our family tree that's mm -hmm. framed and is on the wall in my dining room. Um, in fact, my other, my younger son was engaged at the time and she had already included, she told them they had to go through with the wedding because she had already included <laughs> them on the family tree. Um, and the other thing that she did is she had a cutting board made for my son that says grandma has a picture of my son with my mother, has my mother's strudel recipe in my mother's handwriting on the cutting board. And my son is now the official strudel maker of the family for Rosh Hashanah using grandma's recipe. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and you know, these things are marvelous heirlooms. Um, the focus is now to use them as well to interest the members of your family, to be interested in, 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 in the family history. So hanging the, the tree on the wall and having this wonderful cutting board, see if you can create some kind of questions and activities around that that will interest these future generations. That would be great. Mm -hmm. That's super. I love, I love the cutting board. I, I um, did too. And in fact, I was telling a cousin about it and um, he asked me to send him a picture of it. And my son had sent me a picture with the, surrounded by the four loaves of strudel that he had made this year. And um, I sent it on to my cousin and he just thought it was fabulous. Super. Super. All right, Corey, we have a couple of comments in the chat. So I'm going to ask P Lynn Shapiro from San Diego, do, would you like to share your comment that you put in the chat? And then oh, Frank well, Hildebrandt. I, I just want to tell people, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I did um, these photo books with mixed book and I'm not crafty. And also I have, um, I have problems with my eyes and I can't, can't get the typos. And I, my cousin is a, uh, is a, a, a glass artist and I'm not crafty like her, but I, I put together these photo books and, um, um, and sometimes uh, of my parents, I did, I did one, I went to England where my mother lived and I, I, I went, put in pictures of all the places I visit in England and then the old photographs of where, uh, where they lived. And then I did my um, visits with my grandnieces. And, um, and then I, I did this photo book um, and um, I believe me, anyone could do it. I use mixed book and all you do is copy it in. And then you have, the only thing is I, I'm not a good typist and there's so many typos. I have to keep making other copies to get the typos, but they're not there. This was only like $20. And I don't know if you could see it. No, you can't. But, yeah. um, but also uh, it is overwhelming. And sometimes in some families, not everyone gets along. There's divorces and <laughs> different things. And, uh, and so I didn't put in a lot of commentary because my brothers wouldn't like it. <laughs> so it's their story to their children. But uh, I think we, I had to deal with that when I did it. But I did it in a, in a way that was kind of neutral about uh, different things. And um, it, it kept me going during, and it's keeping me going during COVID. And I went back to the story of my grandparents and we're, uh, I'm ashamed. Uh, I, I say an Ike fetch. You know, I really got into there. There was a book about Kiev Jews. It's called, um, there, you can look it up, and uh, the Jews of Kiev and all the oppression they had there. And it's really, uh, so my nephew's interested in it, and uh, that's all that's needed. My brothers aren't, but that's okay. And this was really very valuable in, in terms of the feelings that come up when you do it. Um, and I think I'll stop because I, it's getting overwhelming. Thanks, so Thank you. Right. Fran Hildebrand, are you there, Fran? I'm on. Okay. okay. You want to share your comment with everybody for us? Please? Well, 
Uh, I'm not I'm not going to come on uh, with my with uh, the video, but I would like to share that Corey, you have been amazing. I, I have I have listened and watched each um, each of your programs. I come away thinking, oh my God, this one is the best. I've learned so much. I'm, I I make copies of everything you send, and then you do the next program, and it's as good or better. And I think how lucky we are to have you. This has been fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. And Pat Danoff? Uh, yes, hi. I'm from uh, the Bethel Sisterhood in Bethesda, Maryland. We wrote this book, Grandparents' Memory Book for Jewish Families, several years ago. And it's been very popular. It's still available. I put the address in the chat, just basically BethelMC.org slash grandparents. And it's used in a variety of ways. You can fill it in. I mean, you can, you can write and fill it in, but it's also been used for like an interview technique. Instead of just saying, tell me about your life, grandma, you ask the questions in the book and then maybe you tape it or maybe a grandchild is doing a project and uses it as an interview or we've done it on Zoom. Instead of just trying to keep a conversation going on Zoom with the grandchild and the grandparent, you use the book as kind of to give it a structure to keep the conversation going. So the book has been very popular. I would uh, have you check it out on our website and it's in the chat and uh, maybe it'll be useful for you. Uh, it's uh, it's also on uh, the resource sheet that first the very first resource okay, good. sheet. good. It's a great it's a great um, resource and it's sheet. not overwhelming. It's not an inch and a half thick. I mean it's it's you know this is what it looks like. So it's not uh, it's doable. Some of these books are so much that you just toss them aside and say I can't do that. But this one it gives you a place to start, and that's what our what our purpose was. Super super thank you. Um, other suggestions, ideas, comments, questions. Yes, yeah, Cindy. Cindy Martyr has her hand up. Okay. Okay, Cindy. Unmute. Unmute, Cindy. Hold on. Okay. I did not. Can you oh. hear me? If yes, but we can't okay. see. Okay. Okay. I know. It's okay. A while ago, my mother didn't know what she was doing, but she didn't realize I was inheriting. She made, before there were composites of pictures, she put in her family room, starting at the top, grandparents' pictures, pictures of my mother when she was 16, picture of my father when he was five years old on a horse, and a burlap. She made it, designed it. This was in the 50s, okay? She started doing this when we moved into our last home in 1957 with my parents. And she had them in a wood thing and she had them on her, in her family room. And now I inherited them. And I have three of these pictures with all the, you know, like what we do with pictures now in, in little circles, they're all matching. And um, so now I wanna continue that, but it's a story without a story, but you just see the pictures. And people, I show it to my grand, my, like my kids, this is who you're named after. <laughs> and this is what grandpa looked like when he was five. I mean, it's without doing a lot of research, it was didn't even realize it. I'm sorry, my computer is not good. That's but okay. but that was uh I'm really understanding it now much better now that I'm the grandma of all these wonderful people and have a family to um they can inherit these pictures. That's, that's fabulous, Cindy. Let me just make a couple of suggestions. Um, one, one of the th suggestions are, I, I have done a collage um, of my mother's family uh, that I showed at the first session. And what I did was I put the names of the people on the picture on the front. Okay. So, because they're not gonna know. The other thing is um, you may want to create a little booklet or something, you know, like in a museum, you have a booklet yeah to yeah. guide you through the exhibits you might want to create a little something like um, numbers to go with the picture well not even numbers but if Parties if you can take stories. pictures of the pictures or take stories and oh. um so that they know what they're looking at because you're going to be able to tell them what they're looking at but they may not be able to tell their kids or their grandkids they may have forgotten 
So this way, if you have an actual uh, real booklet of some sort, um, and I, I, then they'll know what they're looking at. Uh, you may even want to put a family tree. I mean, you could do a whole project just on these pictures, which we're right. And there's about. three of them. There's three, so it's fabulous. It's everybody. I, I show them who I'm named after. That's it's That's wonderful. So cool. And then he passed away. Well, obviously he was passed. It was my grandmother's husband, and then she remarried my Zadie. That's the other side. So when my husband and I walked down the aisle, my parents were actually stepbrother and sister. Uh, Cindy, you could do a whole story worth book on that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, I'm really. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I know, I know. But I, I didn't realize I had all that sitting in my family room now that That's I took out of the house when they move when they pass. Um. That's great. Thank you. Any other ideas or questions? I do not. There's nothing else in the chat, Corey. And I'm great. scrolling. I keep scrolling through, but I don't see any other hands up at the moment. OK, so let, let me ask the group. Um, I, you know, the whole point of this, 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 these six sessions was really to stimulate you to do something, to share your story. And I and I'm hoping that that has helped. Um, yes, it's overwhelming. And as I said during the presentation, yes, it's never ending. I mean, upstairs, um, I have, uh, we have a storage room upstairs and I have two boxes um, and I'm trying to organize my archives because I, I that pictures and documents session, it was fabulous. We had an archivist that was in July and we had an archivist share with us what to do with all those things. Um, and is it work? Yes, but it's so enjoyable. Um, you really, you get a chance to, to really relive your past, uh, forgetting some of the bad stuff and remembering some of the bad stuff. But basically it's, it's, it's a visit with your life and with your parents' lives. And it's, it's very, very special. Um, do whatever you can, but just do something. It can be teeny tiny or it can be major or it can be teeny tiny now. And then you can do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, but you will not be star sorry. Um, there's no pressure. There's no deadline. Um, nobody knows when they're not going to be able to do it anymore. So you just keep doing it as you like and want as the time goes by. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Any comments? Any other comments? Marsha, do you want to share what you did with your pictures? Uh, unmute, Marsh. Unmute. Marsha Topple. Okay. Several, oh my God, several years ago, probably 20 years ago or whatever it is, there was, I had all these photos of my kids that were taken through the years, school pictures, vacation pictures, holiday celebrations, you name it, we had a bunch of photos. I would get them developed in the store. I would leave them in the original folders that we got from wherever I had them developed, you know, the old film version of, you know, the, the camera with the film. This was be even before digital cameras. And I didn't know what to do with them. And they, they, these packages became overwhelming. So we had a um, one winter when we were living in our other home. Um, it was very, very snowy. And we were in the house for a long time. And I took all these pictures. This was about January or February. I took all these pictures and I dumped them on my dining room table dumped every single picture out of all of its folders, dumped them on my dining room table. Well, because they were on my dining room table, I'm sure you can assume that I had an endpoint that had to be, this had to be done. And that endpoint was Pesach because I needed my dining room table. <laughs> so how do you arrange this? What do I do? I mean, I, had, I didn't know how to begin to put this together. So I did them thematically. 
I wasn't sure whether this was the school picture when my son was five or four or my daughter was six or seven. The hair, and, and girls, it's easy because the hair length keeps changing. So you can tell how they're growing by, by the length of her hair um, or the clothes or whatever it is. And I arranged them all thematically. I had one book that says kids grow up and I had all of the pictures thematically. I had friends and family. I had holiday celebrations. I had vacations and I ended up with five mm -hmm. books. So all my Passover, all my pictures with um, for Purim, for Hanukkah, for Pesach, all the pictures that we had taken didn't make any difference what year it was. Everything was in one book. And so that and I, now I have those books, these big photo books, and now I got to figure out what to do with them. But um, the other thing that we did in a skinny photo book, and if I had the effort, I would go downstairs and get it for you. Our family has a tradition of doing a Hanukkah party. And every year we have done a Hanukkah party with going back to the earliest one was like 1970. My mother loved Hanukkah. We did Hanukkah every year and we took pictures of the Hanukkah celebrations and we took a family grouping. Well, the family grouping was small in 1970. And the last time we took a family grouping before COVID, we were 45 people. So that's how the family has grown. Not me, my sister, my sister, but not, not from my side, from my sister. But we took pictures and we've got this photo album. And what I did as a gift to each member of the family when I made this book through Shutterfly and use that venue and did a 20 page book with all of the pictures. My daughter-in-law scanned all the pictures in for me and I picked, you know, picked and chose and did all the pictures. We captured all the group pictures from all of the years. And obviously you could see how the family grew over the years. And on the back of the book, one of the things that we did, my mother had the most incredible recipe for sugar cookies. And so on the back of the book is my mother's cookie jar, which is now sitting in my house, the, the Pillsbury Berry Doughboy Baker cookie jar and my mother's sugar cookie recipe. So it will be forever be preserved as long as people hang on to that book. So those are two things that I've done. But the funniest one was dumping all the pictures, all the pictures on my dining room table. But I had a goal. I needed my dining room table for Pesach. So, and I did, I finished it. Marsha, that's fabulous. Um, may I ask, uh, may I suggest an enhancement? Um, again, it's similar to the, to the burlap, uh, the picture, Cindy, that you have on your, on your wall. Um, if you would take and, and do a, a family tree of those people uh, that are in those pictures, uh, and then on the, if not, if, if only you take the last picture with the 45 people and take and identify, you know, back row with the name. Right, right. Uh, I mean, the, yeah. And, and also do a family tree. And what you can do is just laminate that sheet or put it on a heavier piece of paper and we, have them. We've the got story. a, we've got a family tree. We've done a tree with the reunions and we've added to the tree, but Super. I can make that and, and put it in. And so we'll have the tree. So you can identify the people. Yeah. Be great. yeah. I mean, they're, really they're my sister's great grandchildren, which now number 14. Wow. My sister, who's three years older than me, has 14 great grandchildren. So wow. what can I tell you? <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. Good. Right. Uh, Toby, Toby, um, Corey, Toby Blake has her hand up. So oh, Toby, good. Toby, thank you. Before you start, Toby, thank you for your, your contrib contribution and sharing your ideas. You're muted. Yep. Okay. <laughs> no, nope, you're still muted. Oh, nope, still muted. There, there we you go. go. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to, to help you with this and for renewing our many years of friendship. Um, what I was going to say is another way to do use your family pictures is to make a book for each child or grandchild. And I have done that for my three children 
starting with pictures of them as babies. And I only did it through the beginning of uh, college. I stopped at that point because I figured they had their own photos that they would like to use. And included in that were things like who they were named for, uh, where they were born, places they lived, uh, trips, whatever photographs that I had, many times with their siblings or with the rest of the family. And I gave that to them uh, as Hanukkah presents. And uh, they love them. They, they've been very pleased to have that. So my project now is I'm writing a family history. Uh, I am a hobbyist genealogist and been doing this for many years. And I'm still working on the cookbook that you showed. That is an ongoing project. Maybe I'll get it done this year, I hope. Uh, um, and uh, the blogging is something very easy to do. If you are interested in doing a blog, uh, there are many of them out there free to use. And just choose a topic. And uh, if you research topics for a blog, there are lots of uh, opportunities to find suggestions. And uh, also, if you're going to interview people within your family, there are a lot of oral history questions that are available on the internet. Because just saying, tell me about yourself will get you almost nowhere. But if your questions are specific and pointed, eventually that fact will be answered. It may not be immediate, but it will bring, a, it will come around within a story and you'll get the information you're looking for. So thank you again, Corey. It's been a pleasure. It has absolutely been a pleasure. Thank you, Toby. Um, I just as an addendum to that, uh, my, I'm very old and my kids are very old and I started very young, right? So um, for my kids, for I have three sons and for each of their 50th birthdays, I do a photo book there of uh, David Schneider's first 50 years. And uh, they have, it's not a surprise because they have to help me with those pictures from college and on. Um, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing for them. And they've enjoyed it. And their kids have loved watching, looking at it as well. Um, other suggestions? I love um, Esther, Toby, um, thank you, Toby. Esther has her hand up, Corey. Great, okay. Esther? Um, yeah, I had a question. I relate very much to what Masha was talking about. Um, my project for the dead of winter this year was is to be organizing my all my pictures that are all sitting in boxes and still some of them in the in the photo folders and um, and my husband and I did learn how to use Shutterfly during COVID but my question is what happens to all those actual pictures after you've made these books? Are they discarded? Um, you know, what do you do with the pictures? Okay, so um, I encourage all of you who've got pictures, and I think probably everybody has that box of pictures or carton or trunk of pictures. Um, I, I encourage you to, to view the recording of the July session that was done by the, uh, the archivist to, uh, from the Greater Detroit uh, Federation. She did a fabulous job and covers a lot of that. Um, as far as in what you will, what you will hear or see on that recording is that you never want to give away hard copy of pictures, but if you put them in photo books, that's okay. You can get, you can, you can discard them because okay. then you've still got a hard copy of it. Okay. Um, but don't depend on those scanned photos to be passed on from generation to generation. Uh, and she, she will tell you that a digital copy, um, a digital copy will not last nearly as long as a paper copy. So mm -hmm. you're okay with that. Um, uh, yeah, what, I was on a Robbie Sherman session. Um, yeah. But, you know, part of this is also getting, and I don't want to call the pictures clutter, but getting rid of the boxes and boxes of stuff in the house. And I don't have a lot of storage space. Um, and I use my garage for storage, but my garage is not a place for to store pictures. No. You get, so it's trying to pare down. And I really wanted to 
organize and make books, but then I didn't know, you know, do I feel okay getting rid of the originals or? So um, what I've done, Esther, um, at, and what I'm, I'm continuing to do because it's an ongoing process is once I make the photo books or once I identify the pictures that I really think are, are valuable for the whole family or whatever, um, then I'm, I'm sorting the pictures and mm. for each kid. And I'm putting them, each child has a folder or a box, and then I give them to them and they can do what they want with them. The ones that are of the whole family and whatever else, then um, I am uh, gonna have, uh, you know, I'm putting in photo books or in, a, in another form so that, uh, cause I don't wanna give it to just one child. Um, and uh, that I hope will work and they can throw it out if they want to throw it out. But the things that I think are valuable and there's, you really need to look at those pictures and say, who's going to care? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how many pictures you have of your grandfather or your great grandfather. And if, if picture is not going to be meaningful to you, what do you, the question is, Will it, is this going to be a meaningful thing to have picture, document, whatever, to future generations? Is it meaningful to me today? Yeah. And if it is, then you, you may consider passing it on. And it's, and it's more meaningful if you have had a personal relationship with the, with, with the person. And then going as the generations go on and you come further away from that personal relationship, some of those pictures become less meaningful. Right, and what I've also done with any pic, look, I'm throwing out the pictures of um, our vacations, you know, the scenery, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. um, what I did was I bought a, a box of 12 um, Sharpies, they're ultra fine Sharpies. And I am making sure that any picture that I'm keeping or giving to the kids, um, it has on the back who's there, the occasion, the place, if I know it, and the date. And if I don't know the date, the approximate. Um, so that, because they're going to get lost. I mean, they're going to get separated. They're not going to be put in order. This way, they'll know what it is. Um, I, I mean, it's, I mean, I was looking through some, my box that I have to, I'm working on organizing and um, it was Gus. And I'm not talking about the dog. This was the car. This was, this was my son's car. And this was my son's car after he had his first accident. Um, so these are out now because then I have to label the backs. Uh, the date is on there. And I'm going to give them to him and let him do what he wants with them. I mean, I don't know if, if a generation from now they're going to care that this is the car that their grandfather ruined. Um, but at least I'm going to give it to my son and let him enjoy. So that's something that I won't keep for our family archive, but my son might want to keep it. That's up to him. So I have between now and Pesach to organize all my pictures once I, once I dump them on my dining room table. Uh, yeah, but you might want to <laughs> dump a carton at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Corey, for everything. You're welcome. Um, Cindy? Yeah, well, what do we do today when we have thousands of pictures on our phones? You, uh, so you go and, through and your I have hearts, you know, by the ones that I like, but they're, but it's like hundreds. And so I have to make books for my kids if I want to make them hard copy. Yeah, the, the, the phone pictures are really very good because they're already digitized. Oh. Um, so I, I, what you may want to do, um, there's a couple suggestions. What you may want to do is identify the, look, 17 pictures of your grandchildren in their Purim costume. And keep them on your phone if you want, but one right. picture would pro or two will probably do really well. So be very discriminating um, and download those pictures to your computer that um, you really want to keep and you think are valuable. And then print them or put them in a photo book. Uh, okay. Okay. But you can, thousands of, and I, you know, I'm constantly. Sure, and they're dated by the years and the area where you <laughs> were and all that. Yeah. But once you download them, they're not dated anymore. So oh, um, I, I don't think, I don't know. Okay. Um, 
but you want to make sure that you don't, you know, get, keep your phone clean. <laughs> I got Sorry. all of them. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the date, the date is saved. Oh, the great. Saved. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I make a suggestion? Yeah, don't download them to your computer. Upload them to a professional right. photo book service like Shutterfly or something like that because they stay in that service right. forever. And no, they, they don't. They well, don't. No. Uh, because I used to do, um, I used to use a different book service. Uh -huh. and they're no, it may have been Kodak Gallery or something. They're no longer in business. So you want to be really careful. Kodak Gallery became Shutterfly. Right. But I don't know if they, they migrated the pictures. Oh, okay. I don't know. I mean, but yeah. for all the years that I've been doing that, um, for a number of years, the um, and my daughter-in-law has been doing it since her children were born. So I know there's at least 16 years worth of pictures for her on that service. Um, but that comes in, they, they, they retain the date. So you're going to know when it was. I, I Not would, only did they retain the date on the picture, but they retained the date that you uploaded. Yeah, I would still be very choosy yeah. about um, and and isolate those those pictures that you go right. through. Okay. Um, Thank you. But I agree with you. Seventeen pictures of somebody in their porn costume is a bit much, which is very cute. But <laughs> um, other comments, uh, Corey, I don't see anything. Okay. Well, um, Susan. Yes. Hi. Loved the product. The um, loved it this evening. I, I just want to ask: um, Can I see, or how can I see your past presentations? Um, they're all available on the Women's League website. Um, okay. If you go on the website and there's a search, and you just write into the search box "How to Live Forever," mm -hmm. they will come Got up. It. You Got will see it. all five of them, and you will also be able to see this one. It takes about a week or so. Um, okay. And what we're going to do, thank you, Rabbi Ellen, um, yeah. who made the suggestion, we're going to upload all the resource sheets um, that I've prepared. Uh, I didn't do one. I did many because I, it, it's too overwhelming. Um, so you'll be able to, depending on your topic, you'll be able to... Uh, review the, the resource sheets. And a lot of this is, is from research I've done on the internet. The internet is fabulous. Google is my best friend when it comes to preparing these programs. Google okay. and you. So thank you for the question, okay. Susan. That's great. And that loved your program this evening. Thank you very thank you. much. You're very thank welcome. You. Okay. So I, I want to thank Carol again for doing the Q, doing the Q and A um, for this and other sessions. And of course, Sheila for the tech work. Um, uh, we can't do it without them. Um, so really the series may be over, but please don't hesitate to call on us for help and to share what you, what and how you are doing. And Ellen Bresnick did two fabulous sessions on writing your, your story. Um, and Ellen, on the resource sheets, when I've gotten permission from many of, many of the people who have shared their ideas to put their, their name and email address so you can always contact them. Um, and I have to tell you that it's been such a pleasure doing these, this series and presenting it to you. I've learned an incredible amount and I hope you have too. Don't forget the message of the Russian proverb. <laughs> as long as you remember, you are remembered, you will live forever. May we all live forever. Thank you for coming and keep in touch. Let us know how we're doing and what you're doing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.